take the lead here. Hi there, it's Anastasia from the college. Hey there. Yeah, we, we are going to moderate today and thanks all for joining. I'm just going to give a little intro and then I'll have my team provide just some, some general instructions for our webinar today. Well, first of all, I do want to thank everyone for joining. I'm Anastasia Shamtanis, for those that may not know me, and I'm the registrar here at the college. And as you may know, as part of our strategic plan and our priorities for the coming years, we are committed to supporting the evolving role of healthcare professionals and pharmacy professionals within the healthcare system, and also really wanting to align scope with uh, patient care needs. Uh, as part of that, we have been working with the Department of Health at, uh, partners there to support the implementation of the assessment and prescribing for Lyme disease prophylaxis, which is enabled in our regulations, however, has not yet been implemented as we want to make sure all of the parts are in place to support more timely access to, to patients. So the college will be communicating further details once things are finalized and ready to go. And we're really pleased and so thankful to be facilitating this webinar with guest doctors Jacqueline Badcock, public health veterinarian, public health New Brunswick, Dr. Duncan Webster, a medical director, St. Regional, St. John Regional Health Hospital, Horizon Health, a Department of Health, and Justin Carr, Manager, Provincial Veterinary Laboratory, Department of Agriculture, Aquaculture and Fisheries. And we're so pleased to have experts in the field to also help support this implementation, to present some uh, useful information such that we can properly assess and provide this valuable service to, to patients. So uh, I do want to welcome you and thank, thank you for participants. I know this is the middle of the day. We will be recording. So thank you for those that are on this call. And uh, we will be moderating some questions at the end. And from now, I will turn it over to our guests. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. I really, really appreciate the introduction. Um, I'm just going to try to share my screen. Um, actually, I don't think I've got the ability to share a screen. So I can either share my screen and go through the slides or somebody else has the slide deck. So Colleen, are you able to make Dr. Webster the ho uh, may I allow him to share? Yes, I'll get that done for you right now, Duncan. I'm just having a technical difficulty, but it'll just yeah. be one sec. With me. No problem, no problem at all. Take your time. Um, I'm I'm pretty informal, so uh, no problems with that. And also, you know, going forward, there will be an opportunity for questions towards the end, but if people do want to um cut in to make comments or or ask questions or you know certainly there's absolutely no problem with that because we're going to have have a lot of time so um i'll also just mention justin carr is online with us and and so justin and i will be sharing the presentation uh dr jackie badcock unfortunately is out she's on our injured reserve right now she um but i do want to give uh huge thanks to to jackie for her her work on on this presentation as well as a lot of the background and a lot of work that she will be doing going forward as well so okay so yeah so it looks like i can share my screen here all right can everybody see uh see the powerpoint okay there yes great okay Okay, so yeah, so today we're going to talk about Lyme, Lyme disease prophylaxis, and, and this is going to be very exciting because this is, I believe, going to have you know really direct impacts for our local communities. So thank you to the to the uh, local pharmacies and pharmacists for for taking part in this really important endeavor. So as was mentioned, um, here we go. So I, I I do want to also start by um, making a land acknowledgement. So I, I respectfully acknowledge that I live and work on the unsurrendered and unceded territory and traditional lands of the Wallistiquay. Now I'm I'm in the region of the Wallistiquay. I, I live and work here, and happy to you know honored to be to be living in this area. I know other people in taking part in this uh, in this webinar will also uh, be in uh, traditional lands of of the Mi'kmaq and the Passamaquoddy. 
So making that uh, land acknowledgement, I think, is very important, especially in the context of the type of, of work we're going to be talking about today. So as mentioned, it'll be Justin and I who will be doing uh, doing the, going through the, the uh, talk, and Jack, unfortunately, is unable to join us today. So what the, there's four major objectives. The first objective is to describe the epidemiology, clinical presentation, diagnosis, and treatment of Lyme disease. This I'm going to try to run through fairly quickly, and we can come back to parts of it if need be through the question answer period. But the, the second and third uh, objectives are really at the, at the root of why we're having this discussion today. So we want, we want people to learn how to identify exodes ticks uh, and estimate length of attachment time and understand when prophylaxis of a high-risk tick bite is recommended, and then also provide some useful resources and information. So at the end of this talk, people should be able to describe the current recommendations for doxycycline prophylaxis after a tick bite. They should be able to reliably identify the tick as an adult or nymphal black-legged tick, estimate the duration of attachment based on the extent of tick engorgement, report the efficacy of chemoprophylaxis in this setting, and understand the, the wait and watch option. Important too in going through this process that individuals are able to counsel patients and, and provide information related to tick removal, tick bite prevention strategies, the signs and symptoms suggestive of early and late Lyme disease so that people can seek medical care if needed, and also be able to educate people with regards to diagnosis and treatment of Lyme disease at both the early and late stages. So that's a lot to get through in an hour, so admittedly. So what we're going to try to do is, um, is uh, get through the first objective relatively quickly, and then we can get on to the, the meat and potatoes of this talk. So a little bit about the epidemiology and clinical presentation of uh, treatment of Lyme disease. And I'm just going to put my timer on here so I can keep a, a close eye on how I'm doing. Okay, so Lyme disease is caused by Borrelia. The most common Borrelia that, that we uh, see in our area that we're concerned about is Borrelia burgdorferi. It's the causative pathogen of Lyme disease in Europe and North America. Europe and Asia also see Borrelia afzelii and Borrelia guarinii. So Borrelia are spirochetes, they're sort of corkshoe shaped bacteria, uh, motile. And there are other species of Borrelia and some that we're seeing uh, in our area, Borrelia miomotai and Borrelia uh, maoni is also an important new species that we're seeing. So the vector, when we talk about communicable diseases, we, we'll talk about a few different concepts. The vector is one of those concepts and the vector is the organism that will hold on to that bacteria and transmit it to other people. So they can pick it up from one site and then carry it and transmit it. So that's the vector. And when we talk about Lyme disease, Ixodes scapularis is the important vector, at least in our, in our uh, part of the woods. So Ixodes scapularis, also known as the deer tick, it's seen in Eastern Canada, uh, the Southern regions of Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, and the Northeastern United States. On the west coast of Canada and US, there's the Ixodes pacificus, and it's known as the Western black-legged tick. It can also transmit uh, Borrelia. It's a little less of an aggressive feeder, so uh, less of a concern overall, but still a concern and certainly not something that we would be seeing in, in uh, Atlantic Canada. Uh, Europe, uh, Ixodes ricinus and Ixodes uh, uh, persicatus in Asia. Now the reservoir would be the a host population that that is involved in the life cycle of the organism, and it it's not it's not going to transmit to others, but it can it can maintain the population of of bacteria, and it's like a it's it's a, a large pool or reservoir for vectors to feed on and become infected, and then subsequently move on and transmit to others. So rodents are important reservoir, uh, and of course white-tailed deer uh, that you know we we talk about frequently when we, when we discuss Lyme disease, and birds are very important uh, in terms of the the movement of uh, of the uh, ticks from one site to another, and they can also become a reservoir host 
uh, for Borrelia. Now, another concept is the spill, spillover or dead end hosts. So with the natural evolution of something like uh, Borrelia burgdorferi and its life cycle with, uh, with uh, the reservoirs and the, and the vector, there are some spillover or dead end hosts where they weren't necessarily um, important in the evolution of the life cycle, but they have, they have since become secondary hosts, dogs, horses, and, and humans. They're not Duncan? generally, yeah. Could you share your screen again? Oh yeah, did I drop off there, did I? That's okay. I'll just stop you before we get to the next slide. Yeah, thank you. Uh, try this again. Okay. There we go, how's that? Yeah, perfect. Great, thank you. Yeah, so, um, so moving over from the spillover host, when we talk about tick bites, the risk of acquiring Borrelia, Burgdorferi, and Lyme disease from a tick is actually very, very low. So overall, the risk, if you were, if you, for all comers, if somebody has an, has an exposure to a tick, the, the risk of acquiring uh, Lyme disease from a black-legged tick is only 1.2 to 3.2%, even in an endemic area. So an endemic area, somewhere than 20% or more of all ticks are infected. The risk remains very low. So, so it's important to recognize that and when determining, you know, prophylax or not in some situations, and and also reassuring and counseling people. One of the things that impacts the transmission is the time of attachment. So how long has the tick been on an individual? And if ticks are unengorged and have not fed, the risk is zero, essentially. The tick needs to be attached and begin feeding. And there's quite a process in terms of the where the bacteria sit in the in the hind and the gut of the tick. And after exposure to blood, there's a conformational change in surface proteins that's necessary for transmission as well as a movement up to the salivary glands and a regurgitation. And to go through that whole process, the tick must be feeding. And we'll often talk about 36 to 42 hours when the, great, when the risk is highest. At 24 hours, the risk of transmission starts, but it's really 36 hours or more where there's significant risk of transmission of Borrelia burgdorferi from a black-legged tick to a human. And when you look at a tick and you determine the degree of engorgement, that helps you to determine how long that tick has been attached. There are other pathogens as well that black-legged ticks may carry and can transmit to humans. So anaplasma causing anaplasmosis, Babesia, which is a, a, an intracellular parasite, similar to, to malaria in some respects, and Powassan virus is an important uh, uh, cause of uh, meningitis and encephalitis. Now, the larvae of the ticks are not infected. They will often feed on mice in many instances. That's their first blood meal. And if the mouse that they feed on is infected, then that's when they would, would acquire Borrelia burgdorferi, and then they would carry it for their life. But larva, if you were exposed to larva, there, you would be the first blood meal, and so they would not be infected, and there's no risk of transmission of a larva of a black-legged larva to a human. So, as mentioned, Lyme disease is found in many areas of Canada, and you can appreciate from the map here that it is mostly, you know, in, in the southern parts of the country. So, going west to east, there are parts of the of the west coast where we see um, Ixodes pacificus. Then moving into ranges where we see Ixodes scapularis in around southern Manitoba. Southern Ontario is a real hotbed, a very, very concerning part of Canada. And into southern Quebec along the St. Lawrence uh, Seaway in the southern parts. And then, of course, the Maritimes. Halifax uh, and Nova Scotia are a major site for uh, Lyme disease. And we're seeing a north, northern creep where we've seen initially southern New Brunswick as endemic areas, and we're starting to see risk areas moving northward. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as, as we move forward. But just to say that rates of Lyme disease are absolutely increasing in Canada. They're increasing in Atlantic Canada. They're increasing in New Brunswick. And it is currently the most common vector-borne disease in North America. So a little bit about the clinical uh, findings seen with Lyme disease. 
So this is a great, a great graph and I find really very useful. So initially you're gonna have an acute cutaneous uh, disease following uh, exposure to an infected black-legged tick. So this would be erythema migrans. And I'll go through this in a little bit more detail with subsequent slides. After a period of, uh, of a couple of weeks through to uh, several months, you can hit an early disseminated disease uh, uh, time frame where you have neurologic as well as the potential neurologic disease potential as well as the potential for Lyme carditis. It's in later stages, many months out, where you have late disseminated disease. Here you will have other uh, manifestations of neurologic disease and Lyme arthritis. So coming back to the early localized Lyme disease. So typically if people are exposed to a tick within, it's usually one to two weeks after exposure, but it can be as early as a few days and up to uh, just over 30 days following the tick uh, exposure that people may develop early localized Lyme disease. So flu-like symptoms and the rash, of course, erythema migrans. Erythema migrans can look a lot of different ways, but really cl very classically, you'll have the bullseye rash where you'll have a central uh, area of erythema with a little bit of clearing and an outer ring. So that would be the classic scenario, but you can have slightly different findings where you may even have central vesicles or pustules, and uh, they should be more than five centimeters in diameter and enlarging over 24 to 48 hours, and then they'll resolve in, in subsequent weeks. There are things that can mimic the erythema migraine. So you can have a dark eschar at the site of the tick bite, and you can also have an allergic reaction to the tick saliva. So you can get a small area of allergic reaction around the site of the tick bite, which should not be confused as erythema migraines. Of course, when you have a break in skin, you can have a portal of entry for uh, colonizing flora like Staph aureus. So you can get a, an infection around the site of the tick bite that is not Lyme disease, but rather a cellulitis type picture. And then other arthropod and spider bites can uh, look very much like erythema migraines. But these are often less than five centimeters and don't have that uh, same rapid expansion over 48 hours that you can see with erythema migraines. Early disseminated Lyme disease, uh, you can now see as it, as it disseminates. And the issue with Borrelia burgdorferi is it, it has an affinity for certain um, tissue types in the body. So skin, heart, joints, central nervous system, peripheral nervous system. And this is why you have the manifestations that you have when exposed to Borrelia burgdorferi. So once you have that initial exposure and early cutaneous Lyme disease, it can get into the bloodstream and travel to other parts of the body. And so you can have secondary uh, erythema migraines uh, all, you know, at scattered sites across the body. Again, you can have cardiac involvement where you'll, you can develop a uh, heart block and central nervous system involvement. So you may have headache and neck pain with some meningeal irritation and cranial nerve palsies are actually not uncommon. So a, a Bell's palsy type picture as, as the uh, seventh cranial nerve becomes uh, impacted. The issue with Borrelia burgdorferi is it, it has an affinity for certain um, tissue types in the body. So skin, heart, joints, central nervous system, peripheral nervous system. And this is why you have the manifestations that you have when exposed to Borrelia burgdorferi. So once you have that initial exposure and early cutaneous Lyme disease, it can get into the bloodstream and travel to other parts of the body. And so you can have secondary uh, erythema migraines uh, all, you know, at scattered sites across the body. Again, you can have cardiac involvement where you'll, you can develop a uh, heart block and central nervous system involvement. So you may have headache and neck pain with some meningeal irritation and cranial nerve palsies are actually not uncommon. So a, a Bell's palsy type picture as the, as the uh, seventh cranial nerve becomes uh, impacted. Following Duncan. Okay, so I'll just, I'll just mention quickly, following the early disseminated infection, you can then move into a, a phase termed late disseminated infection. And this uh, you know, is generally three months or more out and neurologic issues become more, uh, more predominant. You can have central nervous system and peripheral nervous system involvement. And arthritis, Lyme arthritis is, is, a is the most commonly seen 
uh, manifestation of late disseminated infection. Now, interestingly, following that, when people receive uh, appropriate treatment, there is a post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome, which is free, which is frequently seen, and it's seen about ten to fifteen percent in ten to fifteen percent of individuals. So even though the infection has cleared, there is still issues with some ongoing symptomatology. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a few minutes. And then, of course, you can have serologic evidence of past infection where people appear fine. There's no, there's no uh, signs or symptoms of, of illness, but serology may be positive based on a prior exposure. Yo, can you share your slides again too, Duncan? Yes. Okay, let's see here. Sorry, I don't know why that keeps falling off, but thanks for letting me know. You're welcome. It's just that they took the host, didn't they? If they gave it to somebody else, that's why. Ah, uh, gotcha. Okay, so we're good here now, I think. Yep. Great. Okay. Okay, so diagnosis of Lyme disease. And I'll go through this quite quickly because I, I think aside from some you know basic background, I don't know that this is entirely relevant to why we're gathering here today, but I'll just mention quickly that. And I guess important to have some of this background because there's a lot of misinformation around Lyme disease and a lot of confusion and some misunderstanding. So just for the record, there, the testing for Lyme disease traditionally has been what we call the standard two-tier testing algorithm. So there's an initial, initial test where an enzyme immunoassay is used, and that's a screen. And if that screen is negative, then that would suggest there is not Lyme disease, unless you're testing too early post-exposure. And I'll come back to that. If positive, that's a screen. So you then need to go on to do a confirmatory test. And traditionally with the standard two-tier testing, we've used a confirmatory Western blot. Now for, um, oh, in terms of some of the misunderstanding, there's a lot of discussion around, you know, people say, well, the Lyme test, the testing for Lyme disease is not sensitive. A lot of, a lot of lot, cases of Lyme disease are missed by the testing used in Canada. It, that's true if you test early. So in the acute phases and the early stages of Lyme disease, yeah, you can miss about half of cases. It, it, absolutely. Because what we're testing for here is an antibody response to exposure. And it does take time for antibodies to form. So if somebody has an exposure and you're testing, you know, just you know, a week or two, three weeks later, you may still have a negative test, but that's why you need to, uh, you can diagnose Lyme disease clinically with something like erythema migrans, or if, if you're concerned that it is Lyme disease and you have an initial negative test and the exposure has been in recent weeks, you should repeat testing six to eight weeks following that exposure. Because what we see happen is in the later stages of Lyme disease, the, the sensitivity of the testing is excellent. There's, there, it is very, very solid. But when you hear people talk about the, the testing for Lyme disease missing cases, it's because you're testing early. If you, if you test in the latter stages, it's very reliable. Uh, the other thing too to note is that there is a move to a new testing strategy called the modified two-tier testing. And what happens here is you have a first EIA screen, which if positive is confirmed by a second EIA. And in doing this, the specificity remains very high and you improve on the sensitivity. The, there are a number of advantages and disadvantages. And again, I think for the sake of time, I'm just, I'm just gonna move on. I will mention that there, you will have a lot of individuals who will wanna have alternate testing done. They are you know, very clear. They wanna have Western blot testing. If you do, if you use some of these alternate strategies, you're going to have a very high false positive rate. So a lot of misdiagnoses, not missed, but misdiagnoses. So there are certainly diagnostic challenges. So in early infection, the serology uh, may be negative. So poor performance in early infection, seroconversion may not occur with early treatment. So that's another point where sensitivity of the testing will be low. If you treat in the early stages of infection, you can blunt the immune response. So subsequent uh, testing will be negative, but the patient's treated. So there should be no concerns there. There is no test of, of cure. It's, again, it's a serologic test and that positive serology may persist for a decade or more. Reinfection can be challenging because if we rely on the serology to make the diagnosis and you've had a prior exposure, that prior exposure may show with subsequent serological testing. So it can make uh, trying to understand reinfection uh, more challenging. 
And again, there's no, no diagnostic testing for post-Lyme disease syndrome. And I'll touch on that just a little bit more. Um, with regards to treatment, and I want to hand it over to Justin in just a second here, I will just say that there are a variety of different guidelines out there, which are all excellent. We in New Brunswick have uh, the Spectrum app being built in Horizon, and we will be running it through uh, with Vitality colleagues. We call this app the First Line uh, app, and it's got a number of infectious diseases uh, uh, guidelines and, and approaches to infections, and it does include tick-borne illness and Lyme disease. It will be coming online very soon. Um, the treatment for Lyme disease is very effective depending on the ma disease manifestation, the choice of antibiotic, and the duration can, can vary from you know, 10 days of doxy for erythema migrans to, to 28 days in the setting of Lyme arthritis. But with treatment, people do very well. People do very well with Lyme disease once treated. Uh, as noted, however, about 10 to 15% of people, even after treatment, will continue to have symptoms. This is termed post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. And this is where a lot of people will talk about the need for longer courses of antibiotics. And we see a lot of people who have had, you know, months, even years of antibiotic treatment. But we've got five randomized controlled trials looking at this. And, and randomized controlled trials are, are the gold standard for understanding what is the impact of treatment and how to identify uh, optimal or appropriate or effective treatments. So of the five randomized controlled trials, there was one that did show some improvement in fatigue over six months, but no change in other, in other parameters. Others did not find the same improvement. What they found was that uh, in, in one study, they found that 12 weeks following additional treatment uh, for post-treatment Lyme syndrome, there was some improvement in cognition at 12 weeks, but by the time they got it to 24 weeks, both the treatment arm and the placebo arm uh, were equal, so no benefits with, with further treatment. And three trials showed no difference whatsoever with regards to those who received placebo and those who re received antibiotics. The very typical pattern is for people to receive additional, receive additional treatment or not, they do generally tend to improve in months following the appropriate treatment for active Lyme disease. The problem with giving additional treatments, of course, is side effects are very common. So you're getting no benefit with potential uh, consequences. Okay, lots of unproven treatments. I'll skip through that and I will hand this over to you, Justin. All right, then. Do you, can you transfer it over? I can stop sharing, yeah. There. Okay, I think- I hope that transferred over to you or not though. No, I think you're still the host. Do you want me to just move the slides for you? Sure, why not? Okay. There we go. Okay. All right, so objective two is for the identification of Exodes scapularis. So next slide, please. And the, we're gonna do two topics. First is how to identify it, and the second is how to uh, gauge the level of engorgement. So if you go to the next slide, what are ticks? Ticks are exto, ex, ectoparasitic blood, obligate blood sucking mites. They're in the class arachnid in the family Exodiae. There's about 11 species you can find in New Brunswick, but of them, there's only five genuses. And the one we're gonna focus on is Exodes. And Exodes, there's a bunch of species we can see here, but the one you're gonna most commonly see are Exodes scapularis or the black tick or the deer tick. That's the common names for it. Next slide. The other ones I'll go over roughly in this one field. You can see that number one tick here is an Exodes scapularis. That's the tick, that's the tick we're looking for. The one to the very right is an Exodes cookii, which is a groundhog tick. It's the second most common one you may or may not see, but you can see there are some differences and I'll go over them in the next in a few slides later. The, uh, the next four ticks that were on that slide are ones that are less common in New Brunswick. The derma centers are gonna be your ones you'll see, and then amblyomers are uncommon, and the hemophysalis and the rufocephalus you won't really detect. They're, they come on, on rodents and pets and things like that. Not really a problem with humans though. Next slide. All right, the ticks are multi-seasonal. They, they live for at least two years, and they can have one host species or multiple host species. Exodia scapularis is a three host species, so it'll feed first on mice, then it'll feed again on larger animals like rodents or, or deer is their main host. Then it'll feed again to from, go from the adult to lay eggs again. 
So they start in the spring generally and they will take a blood meal in the summer. Then they have the molt. It takes a whole lot of all that blood meal has to be converted into the molten, molten, molting, sorry. Then they molt into a nymph. The nymph needs to take a blood meal to molt into a larva or into an adult, sorry. Then the adult needs a blood meal to actually lay eggs. Next slide. The tick size, they're actually really, really small as we all know. So the larva, when they hatch from an egg, they're really, really tiny. They're just like a pepper. And then they have to take a blood meal to double, at least double in size to a nymph. The nymph needs to take a blood meal to at least quarters into an, an adult female or a male because they can split into either. You can see on the right, I have a whole bunch of different ones and they can vary in size and shape and color. But for them, you can't really go by the, the color of the legs. It's more other features, which I'll show you in a, sec in a second here. For tools you're gonna to need to identify ticks will be 70% alcohol generally, this next slide. And uh, you'll need tweezers to manipulate them and a magnifying glass to actually see the features that we're looking for. The alcohol is just immobilized the tick so it's not crawling all over the place. Next slide, please. Here's an example of what the actual eggs look like. So the adult female on the bottom left is uh, covered in eggs. They laid like up to 2000 eggs per feeding cycle. So larvae are very, very small. The nymphs are a bit larger and they're the ones that can transmit Lyme as well as the adults. So the one on the top is a male and the one on the bottom is a female. And I'll describe that in a second or two. Next slide, please. So the difference when you look at an Exodia scapularis, larvae have six legs. So if it has six legs, there's no risk of transmission of Borrelia. The nymphs do have, they have eight legs and they look, appear very similar to the adults which are the adult female and the nymph are almost identical except for the genital pore or aperture is present or absent and the size because the, the nymphs are about a quarter the size of an unfed adult female. The adult males can carry Lyme disease, but they don't take a blood meal long enough to actually transmit any disease. They don't expand when they take a blood meal, they feed for less than four hours. So there's, there's no risk of transmission, but they can actually carry the disease. And a lot of the ticks that were tested for Lyme disease because they were picked up as a nymph or they picked up as a larva and then they test positive as a male but they don't have any risk of transmission. Next slide. So when you look at a tick this is the dorsal and ventral side so the back and the belly. You know, the first thing you look at is on the ventral side which is the belly you look for the anus and the anal groove that will speciate the, or that will uh, give you the genus of the, spe of the tick. Then you look at the sputum and the head and then you can see the marginal groove if it has festoons or not, and I'll describe that in a moment or two. And then you can also see the genital pore or aperture that'll differentiate between a nymph or an, an adult female. So the next slide. So the very first thing you look at is the anus and the anal groove. When you look at the very, very bottom of the tick, there's two pores. The top middle one is the genital aperture. The very, very bottom one towards the posterior end is the anus. You'll see there's a groove that runs around the anus. So if it's if it's anterior or in front of the anus, it's an exodes. If it's posterior or behind the anus, it's a, and all of the other genuses. So the next slide will show that. So on the one, these are both pictures of a male, which is very similar to the female. You can see that the, the anus has a, a groove that's anterior, it's in front of the anus, and it's kind of shaped like an umbrella. So it goes posteriorly. Very next slide. All other species, all other genuses, the anus has an anal groove behind or posterior to the, the anus. So dermis centers, amblyomas, hemophysalis, and ribocephalus, all their, they kind of are behind and it looks more like a wine glass. So you're looking for the umbrella, that's an, a, it gives you an exodes, which has the potential to transmit Lyme. Everything else, if it has a wine glass or you have, you can just see like the cup on the bottom. So it's posterior or behind the anus. It's not an exodes scapularis and treatment wouldn't be advised. Next slide, please. So here's an example side, side by side. You can see the umbrella on the left, that's an exodes. The one on the right is a, a like a wine glass. So that's not, that's a hemophysalis. You don't need to know that if it is hemophysalis or any other species, just it's not exodes. Next slide. So the next thing you'll look at is the sputum. So on the back, on the dorsal side of the tick, you will see a sputum. If it, does, if it covers only a small portion of the body, that's a female. If it covers the full body, it's a male. So the one on the right is a male and the one on the left is a female. Larva and nymphs look identical or look similar to the female, except for uh, the larva will only have six legs and the nymphs won't have the poros area, which you'll see in a moment, and it won't have the genital aperture. Next slide. So the shape of the sputum actually 
it's a dark brown coloring, I guess you would call it. It's uniform. There's there's generally no, they're called inornate, so they don't have any silvery markings, which I'll show you in a moment or two. They're round in exodus scapularis, and they're all slightly longer than they are wide, but they appear as a circle. And they're, they may or may not have hairs on them that you can see. You can see the hairs on this slide. But if you're looking at the actual tick, you may not notice the hairs. It'll just look like a uniform, solid black circle. Next slide. So the one on the left are exodes. The other ones are ornate. So the derma centers have have silvery markings. It's kind of like a it's a shiny material that was is within the actual sputum itself. And the one on the right is an ambulioma, amblyoma, americanum. That's a lone star tick. It has a single white spot on the very on the very bottom. They also have eye spots, which you will see, but you an exodes will have neither of these features. So if you see a round dark circle, it's most likely exodes scapularis. That's what you're looking for. Next slide. You hit the next, next one, Lincoln. There we are. So the shape of the sputum will actually tell you what uh, the actual species of exodes it could be. The most common one you're going to see are the exodes scapularis. As you can see, it's a very round in appearance. Exodes cookii, which are the groundhog ticks, are more angular. They're kind of like a triangle. Exodes marxii, which is the squirrel tick, it's more angular as well, but it's kind of scooped out and elongated. They're a little less common. And then exodes murus, the mouse tick, are shaped somewhat like a teardrop. So you will see those on, on mice, but they're generally nictus, so you won't pick them up unless you're actually cleaning out a mouse nest or something like that. And then that's where you can pick them up. They have the potential to transmit line, but they're less likely. Exodes scapularis is the one on the far left, which you will see the most of. Next slide, please. The next thing you'll notice is the tick have a head. So there's the nathosome is the head and the idiosome is the all, entire body. The actual, all the business end is actually within the head. So it has a hypostome, which is a, it's appendage that has backward facing barbs on it to, to embed within the, the skin of the, the host. It has palps for detecting where it wants to feed at. And the basal capitulum or the basis capitula is the actual head part where it connects to the body. With exodus scapularis, they have typically long, narrow, basis or palps and hypostome versus the basis capitulum, which I'll show you on the very next slide. So ticks are pool feeders. They, when they do feed, they, they take a while to detect where they're going to be at. They will then anesthetize the skin. They plunge the, their uh, hypostome in, lock themselves in place, and then they kind of digest and make a pool of blood and then they'll eat that. So that's why it takes so long. So when you look at an exodus scapularis head, they're very, the palps and the hypostome are more than double the size of the, the width of the basis capitulum. So if you look at that, the, the basis capitulum is kind of like a rectangle and the palps are longer than that. So they're long, narrow is what we describe them as. And the, the pros area is only that those little spots on the basis capitulum are only found within the adult female. Next slide, please. In other species and in Exodes cookii, you, the palps are shorter. You can almost see their equal length in the derma centers and in the hemophysalis. The hemophysalis, they flare out to the sides. Exodes scapularis doesn't do that. So if you see either of these features, then they're not Exodes scapularis or they're not an Exodes species. And you just, and you don't treat. The males will have short club-like palps as well. So they are also one you wouldn't treat. So you're looking for round sputum, long palps. And then if you go to the very next slide, and you also see no festoons. So Exodes genus, they have, they're really on the posterior end of the dorsal side, they have nothing. It's just nice and smooth with a dorsal, with a ventral groove. If you look on the, all the other species, most of them have uh, festoons, they're called. They're little margins that are indentations. So if you see that feature, then it's non Exodes. Next slide. And then the other aspect to differentiate a female from uh, nymph is the presence or absence of this genital pore. The females will have that, and the, the one on the left is a male, the one on the right is a female. That's usually between the last two pairs of the final legs, so that's how you can differentiate a nymph versus an adult. All right, next slide. There's some online resources too. If you go to eTIC, they can you can take a picture with your phone and they'll they can do an ID. They're not a diagnostic tool though, so they don't you can't use it for diagnostic work, but they will identify the tick for you. They won't like, give you the level of engorgement. That's which I'll show you in the next slide. But there's also the guide from Quebec Institute. 
and the handbook for ticks, which you can purchase as well. Next slide, please. So the estimating the length of attachment for time for Exodia scapularis. The ticks feed by inserting a hypostome through the skin of the animals. They drink the blood very slowly. And the, for the first 24 hours, the ticks actually don't, they absorb the blood, but they, they take it as an energy, energy source. They're not using it to store for molting. So they have to, ex, the females need to expand to take the blood meal. The highest risk of attachment after 24 to 36 hours is required for Borrelia as Neil, or as uh, Duncan had said, it takes the Borrelia live in the mid gut and they have to then migrate at the change confirmation, migrate to the mouth parts before they can actually be transmitted. Next slide, please. So the way we do it in the lab is we actually take a sketal indice. So we measure the entire length of the idiosome from the basis capitulum to the very posterior end versus the sputum, because the sputum doesn't change its size. As the tick expands, the sputum is still relatively the same shape and size. So we can measure that versus the other. So for the first 24 hours, as you see on the, the sketal indices don't really change. But after 48, after 24 to 48 hours, they they increase very rapidly and afterwards they can double in size. They go up, up to five times in length. And this is the same for nymphs as well as females. Yep, next slide, please. So for the first 24 hours, from zero to 24, so the tick that are unfed or questing is what they're called when they're in the field and they haven't actually detected a host yet, they will look, be dorsal ventrally flattened. Meaning when you pick up the tick and you look at them, you can see that the top side, they're just basically in two forms. They're like a pancake. And they also have this clear marginal groove. You can see that on the posterior end of the tick on the right, there's a, a groove that runs all the way around it. As the tick starts to feed, this becomes less visible. Next slide. So that's an unengorged tick. That one hasn't fed on anything. So the risk is relatively nil for transmission of Borrelia. As the ticks become engorged, they start to round out. You kind of think of it like a balloon filling up. So when you first get a balloon, it's really flat. And as you blow it up, it's at very the very beginning, it starts to it gets, becomes smaller and then it starts to expand. So the marginal groove will become faint or they'll you'll completely no longer be present. And if the tick goes for two to five times larger than it is engorged and it's been on there for longer than 48 hours. So if the tick is small still and it's has it's zero to 24 any level of feeding to 48 hours it starts to fill up just slightly and then after 48 hours they've doubled in size and anything beyond that is more than 48 hours the so risk of transmission is really high next slide please the same is true with the nymphs so the one on the left is an unengorged nymph you can see the clear marginal groove. The one on the right is slightly engorged, so it's greater than 24 hours, but less than 48 hours. You can see that it's just starting to, it's actually a little bit smaller, and but the folds and the marginal fold is, is becoming less visible. As the ticks are starting to fill, they change color a little bit. They go from this red or muddy brown color to like a white color. If they're in alcohol, that'll change and it'll go black on you, but the color itself doesn't matter. It's more that they start to fill up like a balloon, as you can see. Next slide, please. And here's another level of engorgement. So for the zero to 24 hours, you can see the tick itself has just slightly smaller at the 24 hour mark, but you can see that it started to fill somewhat. At 48 hours, it's more than doubled in length. In 72 hours, it, it doubles again and up to 96. Anytime from 40 hours up, it doesn't matter how well how much engorgement it is, it's just more than 48 hours. So that it's fed long enough to transmit every pathogen that's in the mid gut at that point. And I think that's everything. Beautiful. Awesome. Thanks so much, Justin. You're very welcome. Okay. So we've got about 15 minutes. So I'm going to try to run through objective three. And I, I really want to try to open things up for questions and, and discussion. So, so I'll talk quickly about the evidence for prophylaxis. We'll run through the criteria that are noted here. And that'll be shown again on another slide. And then assessment of tick bites. So in terms of prophylaxis, so th this is a, a nice slide that shows uh, a meta-analysis of, uh, of some placebo-controlled trials looking at use of antibiotic post-tick bite to uh, prevent Lyme disease. So again, important to note at the very beginning that the infection risk is low. Even if you look at the placebo groups in, this, in these studies, the risk of infection amongst those who received placebo was still very low. And the initial studies that were done, 
the numbers were very small. So, you know, they were underpowered studies that showed nothing statistically significant, but it was a Nadelman study that really was well powered and demonstrated statistical significance with provision of prophylaxis. And you can see on this forest plot um, in the meta-analysis that that the studies in, in total do favor provision of antibiotic. And the number needed to treat in all comers, 49. So for when you treat 49 people, you will prevent one case of Lyme disease. But if you focus on visibly engorged ticks, much more effective. So now uh, you treat 11 people with an engorged tick and you're gonna have, uh, you'll, you'll prevent one case. So number needed to treat of 11. Patients in the, in the Nadelman study were from uh, New York State in a hyperendemic area for Lyme disease. And a lot of the recommendations around treatment are based off of this study. So patients in the study were, uh, they presented within 72 hours of tick removal. They were provided either placebo or doxycycline, single 200 milligram dose. They were followed at three to six weeks to look at the development of erythema migrans as well as seroconversion. And what the study found was that amongst the placebo group, there were eight individuals who went on to develop erythema migrans and only a single patient in the uh, doxycycline group. So there was a relative risk reduction of 87%. So that's how effective this is. It's just under 90%. And again, this is statistically significant number needed to treat 36. Of those nine individuals who developed erythema, erythema migrans, nine had serial conversion. Um, let's see to hit the high points here. So I guess another point though, that's really important is that doxycycline is not without side effects, of course. So you know, you say, well, anybody shows up with a tick, let's just give them all doxy. Or somebody says, I don't have the tick, but hey, I, 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 I'm sure I had a tick. Um, you know, why not just give everybody a dose of doxycycline? And the reason is because there are uh, adverse effects associated with doxycycline. So a lot of, a lot of nausea, and that's the, the major issue, major uh, GI upset. So, you know, we need to do no harm is certainly got to be our, our mantra. And so being strategic in terms of when you give doxycycline prophylaxis is important. So when do the risks when are the risks outweighed by the benefits? So when people meet these six criteria, so this is the take home slide. If there's one slide that you had to sort of screenshot, this would be it. So when people present with a tick and you, you, this is what you need to make sure. You need to make sure they're asymptomatic. You don't wanna treat somebody who has Lyme disease with a single dose of doxycycline because it's not gonna be appropriate treatment. You wanna make sure that the tick that they've been exposed to is in fact an exodes tick. As uh, Justin has, has talked about, there are a lot of other types of ticks, other genus, other species, and non exodes ticks will not uh, transmit Lyme disease. Those that are other species, it's gonna be a little tough to differentiate. So if you can just be confident that it's an exodes tick, that should be good. The ticks should have been on for at least 24, but preferably 36 hours or more. And that's where looking at the degree of engorgement will be will, will help guide your decision. It, you should be in an area where ticks are infected by by uh, exo by Borrelia burgdorferi. So if you're not in an endemic area, then you shouldn't be thinking about giving uh, prophylaxis if somebody has picked up the tick in that area. And that's where maps that will show you will become very helpful. The tick rate in an endemic area, the, the, the rate of infection, the rate of, of infected ticks is greater than 20%. And uh, the tick should have been removed within 72 hours. And you wanna make sure that there's no contraindication to doxycycline. If, there, if, if people meet these six parameters and you can give a single dose of doxycycline 200 milligrams or for pediatric patients, 4.4 milligrams per kilogram. And, uh, Outside of doxycycline, there's no evidence that alternate antibiotics will have any impact. So you shouldn't go looking for something beyond doxycycline. So just to go through those one more time. So criteria number one, patient is asymptomatic. Criteria number two, the attached tick is an exodes tick. And Justin has done a really nice job going through that, demonstrating what you're going to look at and help you to identify, help you to be comfortable that the tick you're looking at is an exodes tick. Number three, 
The tick was attached for at least 24, but preferably 36 hours or more. And again, reason being, because if they've not been on that long, they will, even if they're infected, they won't transmit. And so you can look at the degree of engorgement to help guide you in terms of uh, saying, yes, this is a tick that's been on for 36, 48 hours or more, and then consider prophylaxis. Criteria number three, exposure occurred in a Lyme disease endemic area. So um, that again is based on the rates of infected ticks in an area and rates of Lyme disease in an area. And so what, these are maps. This is, a, this is an example of a map that is, it's a, it's a green document. So as things change in our province, which we've been observing over recent years, the maps will change as well. So we will keep track of what's going on in different parts of our province. And if you've got somebody in a higher risk area, uh, Southern Zone 2, absolutely, that person should be considered for prophylaxis. And in the moderate risk areas as well, you could consider the more northern parts of the province. Uh, there really should be no indication for providing Lyme disease prophylaxis post-tick exposure unless somebody has a travel um, history with, with recent exposure in, one of, in an area that is endemic. Criteria number four, prophylaxis must be started within 72 hours of tick removal. And so a few tips here in terms of how to um, go, go about removing a tick, because there's a lot of different uh, folklore that people will talk to. You know, people say you got you to gotta heat up the area with a lighter and this sort of thing. Not at all. Just use something. Forceps are fine, small tweezers. You just want to pull, grab close to the skin gently and with steady pressure, just pull. If there is an, a, a bit of the tick that is left within the skin, it's okay. The, the body will get that moved out eventually and you don't need to go digging around to try to get it out and you can clean the bite area. You wanna make sure doxycycline is not contraindicated. So just a few important points here. It's a single dose. So you can give single dose doxycycline to, to children. And even in the setting of pregnancy and lactation, it may still be reasonable following discussions with the, with the uh, individual. So pregnancy is not contraindicated um, for a single dose of doxycycline and with breastfeeding as well. And, and those discussions can be had and, and it can be safely given. Really, if somebody's got uh, you know, a, an IgE-mediated allergic reaction, okay, yeah, now you want to avoid giving doxy. Okay, we are pretty much out of time. We've got five minutes. So I'm actually just gonna stop here and open it up for, for any uh, discussion because I don't wanna miss the opportunity for some discussion. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Webster and Justin. We really appreciate it. That was very practical and enlightening. And I do wanna thank the Department of Health and Joanne Layton also for helping to organize this. I do wanna apologize we were unable to get the simultaneous translation working. However, we will be in contact with everyone sometime this week to provide an alternative. So um, what we can do now is, is open it up to see if anyone has any questions for our expert speakers. If you wanted to use your raise hand function, if you wanted to turn your camera on or... So I can start by asking a question. Do we have a sense as to when this will be up and running? We think about the, the very practical approaches. When, when will this be okay for pharmacists to prescribe doxycycline in this setting? Because I don't honestly know. I, I think it's, it's very soon and I'm not sure of the, the logistical issues there. Yes, thank you for that, I'm sure. Many people on this call are wondering. I'm not sure if my partner at the Department of Health, Joanne, would like to speak to that. Uh, I can say that it's uh, there are certain pieces that are being worked on, and the goal is is I know it's certainly coming up soon. Um, Joanne, did, did you want any to add? Did you want to add anything? I see you're there. Hi. Yes. Hi. Yes. Um, I, um, I don't have an exact date that I can share, but we are expecting um, to have something in place very soon. Awesome. 
Okay. Yeah. I, I think that's my understanding as well. I mean, we're, we're into spring and the ticks are, the ticks are becoming more active already. No question. So yeah, it, it'll be short order. I see a couple of questions in the, um, in the chat box too. So great, great questions. So um, Trisha asks if patients present after more than 72 hours from tick removal, where should we orient the patient? So that's a it's a very good point. So thank you for bringing that up. If somebody does not meet criteria for provision of prophylaxis because they're outside of that 72-hour window, they should be counseled to watch for the onset of symptoms, signs and symptoms of Lyme disease with over the next 30 days. Because this is the time frame where people can become ill. And if they do, then they should present to their primary care provider. If they don't have a primary care provider, then you know seeking out medical help either through a uh, a walk-in clinic or uh, or emergency department. That would certainly be the approach. And and important to note that the efficacy of the prophylaxis is actually not 100%. Right, it, the relative risk reduction was 87%. So even those who you, who you do provide prophylaxis to, they should still be counseled, even though you're taking this dose of of doxycycline you could still develop Lyme disease. So watch for signs and symptoms. And if you develop them, then you've got to seek out medical care for appropriate treatment. So very, very good question. And thank you for, for asking that. Same as the criteria, if, if you didn't have the physical tick when prof, prophylaxing, because it's the same situation, you didn't meet all the criteria because Blair had asked that question beforehand. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So thank you for yeah. that. Great question, yep. Blair. And the, yeah, go ahead, Justin. Oh, no, I was just saying, and the next question was about, should pharmacists be able to remove the ticks from the patients? I believe anyone really can remove it. I don't see why it wouldn't yeah. be able to. Yeah, it's good. prompt removal is the best option. So if if, they're per, if the patient isn't comfortable removing it, then the, absolutely the pharmacist should be able to remove the tick. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And uh, at what age would be too young for, for doxy references to say eight years old? Y yeah, re references will say eight years old and they will talk about, uh, you know, dental staining. But it's interesting, more, more data has come out in recent years that uh, the te tetracycline was, was more of an issue. Doxy, the question about dental staining, it, it's, it's not so clear. And there's some good data actually using doxycycline to treat pediatric patients for Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And they didn't find any issues. And so currently the, the question of using doxycycline in the pediatric population, um, the, the data would suggest it's fine to use. And for a single dose, the recommendation is there, there is no age too young for a single dose of doxycycline. And again, you want to make sure that there's good rationale to use it. They meet the criteria, but you can counsel parents to say, no, it is fine to go ahead and, and use a single dose of doxycycline in the pediatric population. If, if people aren't comfortable with that, totally fine, totally fine. And advise them to monitor for onset of Lyme disease within the next three to 30 days. Yeah, so great, great question. And then another question, should we send the tick anywhere? We would love to have your ticks. Justin, do you wanna maybe comment? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, if it's from a human, we, we can advise to send it to the human hospitals. But otherwise, if that's not an option, I'd definitely take your ticks. I've been storing them and I'll use them for studies, hopefully very shortly. Yeah, there, there are. And, and you can, you, you could also use it a little bit to uh, help to, you know, even as some quality assurance for the work that you're doing, if you're taking ticks, you can submit them to the to the human lab. So each, each micro lab across the province has its own uh, tick identification system, which is part of the broader provincial network. And there is a Horizon Health uh, submission um, uh, requisition. Now you do need a physician or nurse practitioner attached to that. So if there's an issue there, you can always give me a call and depending on what part of the province you're in, uh, I don't mind you using my name as the uh, submitting physician. Excellent. And uh, yeah, yep. Exciting. This will be coming soon to pharmacies. I agree. This is this is going to be big. This is this has already been done in Nova Scotia. I'll just mention, and they've had a very good uh, 
uh, response so far. It's worked well. They are just now beginning to uh, look at um, going back through the data to understand how things have gone. One of the things that came up was that question about pharmacists being described a tick bite, but people not having the tick. And that has been a bit of an issue. So, but really the recommendation is if, if people don't have a tick, then you shouldn't be submitting, or you shouldn't be uh, prescribing the prophylaxis. Uh, for children and adults less than 45 kilograms, should a lower dose be used? Yeah, so there is a, a dose there, 4.4 milligrams per kilogram, I believe was the, um, was the uh, milligram per kilogram dosing. So yeah, you use, a, you use the dose based on weight and that's in the talk. Um, second or third choice antibiotics of severe allergies for prophylaxis doxy is it there's data there's no data for anything else earlier studies looked at things like amoxicillin did not show benefit so so no there's for prophylaxis it's doxycycline where the evidence is or nothing so if they can't take it because of an allergy then you could again advise them whether you they take the prophylaxis or not that they should continue to monitor for the next three to 30 days for signs and symptoms of Lyme disease. Yeah, and the whole goal the, is to try to prevent, try to prevent seroconversion. So you wanna give them the doxycycline so that they don't become endemic or don't get the Lyme bacterium. You wanna kill it while it's still circulating, right? Exactly, exactly, yeah. So that would be, that would be prophylaxis. And in terms of treatment, I mean, if, if you're talking about prophylaxis, no, there's no age restriction. It's, it, it can be weight-based. And if you're talking about treatment of Lyme disease, well, that's that's a different topic. There are second and third line options, and uh, treatment would be would be different based on the uh, the disease stage. And uh, yeah, you wouldn't have to worry about that from the pharmacy. So, how do we obtain supplies to send the tick? And can someone send us the information with procedures to follow? So yeah, we can certainly um, put together some information. So if, if the, uh, the college wants to reach out to Jackie and Justin and I, um, you know, we can certainly put together that information and then it can be disseminated throughout the, throughout the province. Yeah, thank you for that. And can you comment on the state of the art with respect to prophylactic Lyme vaccination in humans? So the state of the art right now is that there there is no vaccine. There, there was a vaccine in the past for Lyme disease. And because, you know, our market is sort of a supply and demand and Lyme disease was pretty limited to certain geographical regions. It just, uh, it, it, it wasn't a vaccine that, uh, that had a lot of uptake. So it was taken off the market. There's with the resurgence of Lyme disease and, and expansion of vector distribution, there is some more work now being done on bringing a new uh, vaccine to market, but, but it's not here yet. Okay, well, thank you so much. If there are any questions, I, and thank you for staying over our speakers and our guests. If there are any other questions, please send them to the college uh, e info email and we can triage them and, and Dr. Webster and Justin, if you're okay, if uh, we need to reach out to obtain any answers and we are happy to share information as we prepare for implementation. So Excellent. thank you so much. We appreciate it. Um, and again, I just want to thank you on behalf of the college. Thank you, Joanne, uh, Duncan, and Justin. And uh, we, we look forward to continuing to, to work alongside you once we're implemented. Absolutely. We, we, we see this as a partnership, so we're not going anywhere. So if you feel like there's some unanswered questions or some next steps, perfect. Because we're not going anywhere. We'll, we look forward to working with you guys going forward. And, and thank you so much for, for helping with this important uh, aspect of community medicine. Yes. Thank, thank you. you very much for inviting us as well. Appreciate everyone's time. All right. Thank Take you. Bye-bye. Bye now.